Hi all, a very, very exciting event going on is the Chessable Masters. So you might know I've done quite a lot of interesting uh, chessball related videos for the excellent online courses. And it's amazing they're organizing this tournament online. So the 2020 Chessable Masters has many of the strongest players in the world, including the world champion Magnus Carlsen. Here is a classic match. Hikaru Nakamura, also one of my favorite Super Grand Masters. Let's have a look at this match. This is in round six of the Chessable Masters. Uh, the time limit is it's a rapid time control. So we have d4 from Magnus. The, the Kimura plays uh, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3. We have a queen's gambit declined for the moment. Knight c3, bishop e7, bishop f4, black castles, a3. This is a little bit off the beaten path. e3 has been seen quite a bit. For example, uh, there has been a game Carlson against Nakamura played in Zagreb 2019 with e3 in which uh, Nakamura played c5 and got uh, a really uh, quite a solid position like this and eventually um, though it it actually went went to port after actually <laughs> Magnus Carlsen managed to win uh, that game in uh, in 43 moves but the opening seemed solid enough there. Anyway, so a3 was played here, knight bd7. And now here, a kind of pedantic looking move, knight b5, forcing black to defend c7. So we have knight e8, e3. One potential perk that this knight sometimes might be able to go to d4 under the right circumstances if there wasn't a pawn on d4. Other than that, it looks as though the knight generally should be heading back to c3. Nakamura takes on c4 here and after bishop takes c4 uh, he actually plays c5. This is rather interesting. This was an opportunity to maybe kick the knight back with a6 for example uh, to stop the knight using this d4 square. So once it's on c3 there's a couple of options here which are fairly, you know, relatively solid. One is b5, and the strategic risk after b4 is a clamp on c5. But white's advantage might only be, it might not be that big a deal. The other way to play it is an immediate c5, trying to avoid that bind on the c5 square. Uh, so if we just go back, so after b5, just to play c5 immediately. And yeah, this this is a kind of interesting position as well. But uh, in this game, we have a very unique path indeed being set with c5. And now, in fact, Magnus realizes this. there's a potential perk of the knight not necessarily having to return home to c3, but potentially using the d4 square. And we have this move d takes c5. And now after a6, the knight actually uses d4. Is there any advantage in the world of this though, after bishop takes c5? What is uh, the advantage of this? White castles, we have queen e7, rook c1, bishop d6. Now this bishop retreats back. Black does have some tangling issues. This c8 bishop is a major issue quite often in the queen's gambit declined. And uh, here we see knight d f6. If black plays bishop takes f4, this would only really serve white, it seems, in this situation with that comfortable e file pressure, a lock on e5. The double pawns are, are really no great solace for black here. Uh, this kind of position, even g4 might be possible with a big advantage. Yeah, it's just stopping black using the f5 square g4. And white's got that huge bind on the position here. So, okay, we have knight d f6. And this does release control of the e5 square, which is pounced into immediately a kind of weakness of the last move effect. And now, uh, yeah, thrashing around a bit planlessly actually, but it's difficult for black in this position. Nakamura plays knight d7 back again, as if, well, maybe there's gonna be a draw on, on the on the board with a repetition. Maybe he's expecting a draw. Instead of this, if we look at this, if the bishop tries to come out to play, then 
queen b3 and bishop b1. This is a very, very comfortable position for white indeed. This kind of position here. These knights are actually looking rather impressive and dangerous. But maybe, you know, there's not no not an immediate bust here. In the game though, after knight d7, I wonder if you can guess what Magnus Carlsen played in this position, which is a super strong move. If I give you 10 seconds to pause the video, what would you play with white? Okay, sometimes I say to students about expensively protected pieces, although there's no undefended pieces apart from this rook. There is a kind of expensively protected piece, d6. I wonder if that helps give you a clue. It's expensively protected because it's protected by the queen. Magnus pounces on this with knight dc6, so attacking the queen's protection of d6. We have queen h4. This is rather critical. If b takes c6, knight takes. The thing is, the queen has to flee now. And then bishop takes d6. This is really quite nasty, this position here. White is putting a lot of weight on the black pieces. There's a threat of knight e7 taking and taking on d7. For example, here, knight e7, knight takes c8. And white emerges a piece up. So it's very, very dangerous. We have queen h4. And now, actually, bishop g3 is played. Also strong is knight takes d7. For example, like this is very nice for white. Uh, this kind of position is, is going to be an advantage positionally. But uh, bishop g3, very strong. Queen g5, and another tempo gaining h4 move. Queen f6. Uh, if the queen goes to h6, then it can still be harassed actually with knight g4. And if queen h5, bishop takes d6, this position white's getting a big advantage. So, okay, we have queen f6, knight g4, offering b2, that's taken. Bishop takes d6, but white is going to be winning the exchange after these transactions. B takes, rook c2 protecting that bishop. Also, white could have just taken that rook as well, but rook c2. And now winning the exchange, bishop takes f8. So not a great outcome from the opening at all uh, to be the exchange down here. For one pawn, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. So h5, that's a very uh, tricky move indeed. We have uh, h6 being played. It was possible uh, technically to take on h5 just then. Uh, because if the trick, if we look at the tricks, knight f6 rebounds with knight takes protecting the queen. It was possible to take it just then, but h6 was played. Now queen f3. Now indeed it is taken with that still that trick there for knight takes if knight f6 check. We have queen takes c6 hitting the rook. Magnus is after winning another exchange if queen takes g4. Uh, knight c7 protecting the rook, trying to just get an exchange of knights instead. Of losing yet another exchange. Queen f3, even if white just plays the exchange up with queen takes here, this is much better for white. So, anyway, queen f3, which does now threaten indeed knight f6 check to win the queen. This is only temporarily, it's not ideal, knight d5. But the thing is, uh, it's not just this threat, it's the threat of rook takes c7. <laughs> so, it's a double attack. The double attack is one of the most lethal weapons. If you read uh, Soan's Winning Chess Tactics, he says the double attack in chess is often one of the core elements of even advanced, sophisticated tactics and combinations. And here, you know, because we're restrained to one move per turn, you know, black is having difficulties against the twin threat of knight f6 and, and rook takes c7. So this is a rather desperate move, knight d5. And Instead of taking it, which would be a delight, well, a relief, it's still losing for black after queen takes, but even more devastating, though, is just to try and nudge this knight away to reignite the knight f6 tactic if the knight moves to win the queen. So it's a very desperate state of affairs. We have e5, and here Magnus is setting up even more double attacks. Can you guess what he plays here? If I give you 10 seconds to pause the video, white to play here.
Okay, knight takes h6 check, basically forcing the queen to take there. And the game actually ended here. If it carried on with queen takes h6, bishop takes d5, hits, it's not a double attack, hits a8 and f7. And the rook's kind of loaded up, protecting c8 as well. So if rook a7, we just take on c8. Yeah, otherwise if rook b8, we just take on f7. And then this, this is a disaster. Just winning that night, for example. So yeah, quite a crushing win. It took my attention away for the moment from TSEC, but I will be back on TSEC. There are some interesting, blunderful games because of the fast time control. So I thought it's an immense contrast from the TSEC high precision engine chess world. But you know, quite entertaining. <laughs> but variety is the spice of life, as they say. So I thought I should, you know, check this out as well. It got my attention. I hope you enjoyed this. And got something out of it. Uh, so, if you want to uh, challenge me for a game, kingscrusher.tv. If you just register via that, I'll be able to invite you for a game after all. kingscrusher.tv slash. Sorry, that's my chat room, kingscrusher.tv slash Discord. You can also use the bit.ly if you prefer, bit.ly slash chessworld to register at chessworld. I'll be able to invite you for a game. Okay, comments, questions, likes, subscribes, all appreciated very much. Thanks so much.